Episode 117 of Australia's number one marketing show. Listen in as I chat with one of Australia's leading radio producers about how to treat your customers as raving fans, a simple strategy for generating new ideas, and some very smart ways to use social media. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Tim Reid. G'day, everyone, and welcome back to Australia's number one small business marketing show. I am your host, Timbo Reid. You right there, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, are a motivated small business owner who wants to do crackingly good marketing. And we are brought to you by the very good folk at Net Registry, and we are part of the Flying Solo community. So hello to you, all you solopreneurs out there in the big wide world. Hey, welcome to episode 117, guys, of the show, and I am excited to bring it to you because, again, again, backing right up from last week's episode where we had Mia Friedman of Mamma Mia fame, 14 million monthly page views. Hello. How good was that interview? Great feedback, by the way. You know when an interview hits the mark because the amount of uh, commenting and sharing of that interview, of that episode, was very high, and I know how much you, the listener, enjoyed that. But backing right up, we have got a great guest today in Sam Kavanagh, a very old friend of mine, and uh, Sammy is now um, very high up in the biggest radio network at work in Australia. And he's going to talk to us about this concept of taking listeners and turning them into raving fans. And it's just as applicable in our small businesses as it is in a large radio station. We cover a whole lot more. Back to that in a minute. A um, few things to cover up front, guys. A bit of stuff that's on my mind. I just want to say a big thank you to Ted who sent me um, sort of a lovely testimonial um, in regards to net registry. Remember, Net Registry are the sponsors of this show, and if you need to get any of your online marketing sorted, then they are the people to go to. And Ted went to them, and he just sent me a lovely note saying, "Hi, Timbo, um, would like just like to let you uh, let you know that while I was considering several companies to get your to get our AdWords and SEO sorted, I decided to go with Net Registry because of your affiliation. It was that association that gave me the confidence to call Sam, and Sam is um, Sam is." Uh, one of the senior guys at Net Registry who um, you can have some time with and he will help you get your online marketing sorted. Um, SEO, AdWords, web design, hosting, domain name registration, you name it, the guys there can can really sort you out. Um, Go to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, click on the banner, the Net Registry banner on the right-hand side and it'll take you to some exclusive listener packages. Um, They are very good. Hey, some exciting news. Jess, Jessime, Jessime is on board the small business marketing virtual team, the virtual marketing team. Okay, so I spoke um, at a conference in November last year and Jess was the scribe, okay? She had a whiteboard there and she was capturing everything I was saying in, a, in visual, in, in pictures and words. It's sort of like it was a, a, a live way of putting together an infographic and it was fantastic. So, you know, here I am speaking and she's turning into these pictures and words. Don't know how she kept up to tell you the truth. She has a business called Think in Colour and I approached Jess afterwards and said, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great if you could do that for episodes of Small Business Big Marketing where we, we, we take the spoken word and turn it into something visual and she's done her first one. They're called Scribes um, and they're very, very cool. Not only has she scribed um, the interview I did with Tom Dixon from Willard Blend, but she has also videoed herself doing the scribe and done it in fast motion, and it's fantastic. So you can view the scribe. If you go to the Tom Dixon interview, and I'm going to do this real time because I forgot to uh, dis- I forgot to uh, check what number interview that was, but it was a very, very recent one. Here I am doing it on the hop. On the hop, there he is, Tom Dixon, episode 114 of Small Business Big Marketing. It was the Willop Blend episode. So um, I am going to drop the scribe that Jess did into that episode. I'll also drop it into the show notes for this current episode, plus the video 
plus I'll put the video on YouTube, etc. Now, this is really exciting. Um, it adds another layer to the show, but just as a marketing lesson, this is all about repurposing existing material, yeah? Getting more out of it, squeezing more juice out of that orange, um, blood out of the stone. And what it's also allowed me to do is have a good reason to open up a Pinterest account, okay? Because up until now, I haven't had a Pinterest account uh, for the show, didn't really see a need to. But I've opened one, and having and and obviously that there's going to be a Pinterest board um, for all the scribes that Jess does. Um, but it's also then encouraged me to open up a Pinterest board for that it contains a photo of every past interviewee, which I could have done anyway. But I just kind of didn't think about it until I had the need to really consider Pinterest with these scribes. And in fact, the idea came from someone who I'm about to talk about in a minute, uh, who I've also added to my virtual marketing team. At, we are getting things done at the Small Business Big Marketing Headquarters, let me tell you. Um, more exciting news, um, I have opened up a Meetup account, meetup.com. If you go to meetup.com forward slash small hyphen big hyphen small, <laughs> start again, it's, it's meetup.com hi, uh, forward slash small hyphen business hyphen big hyphen marketing. I'm having a brain fade at summer. Um, I have uh, started a meetup account. Haven't set up the first meetup yet, but my intention this year is to have some live meetups, certainly in Melbourne, because that's where I'm based. And when I do travel, um, actually then um, scheduling a meetup, whether it be, you know, uh, somewhere interstate around Australia, or if I have any overseas travel, also organising some meetups, because I'm just so keen to meet you, the listener, and bring us all together, bring the tribe together, and just increase the power of the small business big marketing uh, brand and the tribe. So that's exciting. Go and join the meetup and you'll be the first to know. Um, and I will put a link on the website, which is being redone, still in the process of redoing the smallbusinessbigmarketing.com website. Um, last point before I get into Sammy is that um, I've got a question for you because one of the things that's been happening to me over the last couple of weeks is that I made a kind of concerted effort to be working on my business um, during this quiet time over summer um, and that is all about just you know ticking some boxes of stuff that I hadn't done previously and asking myself who do I need to put on my virtual marketing team to get stuff done and, and part of that was asking myself the question like what am I not good at? You know, what do I? What am I not good at? What do I, what, what don't have? I have the skills at. What don't I enjoy doing? And then filling those gaps. And one of those gaps was filled by Mick, who's um, approached me. Mick is a long-time listener of the show, and I'm going to call him Mick the Mechanic because that's exactly what he is. Uh, not a car mechanic, but a mechanic type person. You know, like that uh, wealth dynamics profiling of Roger Hamilton's that we've spoke spoke to a couple of years ago. You know, the mechanic type profile is that person who knows how to get stuff done, get under the hood and fix stuff uh, and, and do all the technical stuff. And Mick has been added to the uh, small business, big marketing team as my mechanic. And that's why, you know, Pinterest is set up, Meetup is set up. There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes in regards to linking social media accounts the way they should be. Um, WordPress plugins that, you know, weren't there or are there and just, just, just getting stuff done, you know, that I hadn't been doing because didn't want to, didn't enjoy it, no good at it. Um, and so I guess my question to you is, who is missing on your virtual marketing team? Have you got a virtual marketing team, you know? Number one, and number two, if you have, is it filled with the right people and enough people? Because, you know, there has never been a better time to market a small business, and part of that is having a virtual marketing team. The virtual marketing team is that concept of surrounding yourself with marketing specialists somewhere in the world who focus on one particular area of marketing. Um, yeah, it's, it's at its most basic, it's outsourcing, but it is about putting together that team that allows you to focus on what you're good at. What I'm good at and what I enjoy is creating content, is about doing the interviews, and, and adding this virtual marketing team is freeing me up to get stuff done. So there's a bit going on, isn't there? Um, okay, 
Let's get stuck into this interview. Sam Kavanagh, Sammy introduces himself pretty much once we get into the interview anyway, but uh, he is the national executive producer of the biggest radio uh, network in Australia. He's responsible for some very big shows. Um, He is going to talk to us about how to turn listeners into fans. He's going to talk to us about idea generation and the process they go through within the shows to put together um, to put together great ideas for each of the shows that he produces. Um, Interestingly enough, this whole concept of turning listeners into raving fans was inspired by a consultant that he brought to Australia to talk to many of his on-air radio personalities. And that consultant worked very much one-on-one with the biggest Irish band going around. Can't say who that is. Cannot say who that is. Because Sammy didn't say who it is. But one of those big Irish bands, you know the one I mean? Uh, And she came out and um, did some great work with... Um, their on-air radio personalities all around this concept of listeners into fans. We also talk about repurposing content, listener generation, and I pose the question, what should we call fans of small business big marketing? Let's come up with a name. Talk about that more in the episode. Um, I do interrupt the episode halfway through because Sammy touched on a sensitive topic that needed to be ripped out of the interview and replaced with another example of which I give. So I step out of the studio for a couple of minutes and share an example um, of a deep dive mastermind um, member in which we used Sam's idea generating process. Enough! Let's get over and see Sammy Kavanagh. Enjoy, guys. See you on the other side. Sammy Kavanagh, welcome to Small Business Big Marketing. Thanks, Tim. It's good to be on this side of the microphone. Hey, it is. For the first time. Well, explain what that means because um, you are – what is your title in the Oz Stereo Network? It is the – I'm the National Executive Producer, um, which sounds awesome, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> like that is – that is full of awesome. It's got the word national in it and the word executive, executive. in it. Did you notice that? Yeah, just need corporate in there somewhere. Well, so to, just to us uh, novices, what does that mean? Because you are not – you'd spend a lot of time with people who are behind the microphone. That's right. Uh, yeah, on and, the other end. And in front of the microphone. So I look after – essentially, uh, so the Osterio Network, uh, Southern Cross Osterio as we're now called, has the Today Stream, which mm-hmm. is Fox FM in Melbourne, Today uh, FM in Sydney. We should talk in a global way, just the big radio stations of Australia. It is. And then the other network we have is Triple M Network, which is another national network. We have stations in every state and mm-hmm. regional market in Australia. So we've got 80 radio stations now. And you are the national executive producer of those stations. So I look after after shows, talent, producers, mm-hmm. um, obviously not all shows and all talent because mm-hmm. that would be uh, too hard, but <laughs> I look after, essentially I'm uh, responsible for uh, developing new talent on air as well as developing new talent, uh, finding new producers and Keeping helping- old talent happy. Yes, so there's a bit we're talking, of that. Hamish and Andy, Jules oh, and Fifi. Yep. Uh, so Merrick and the Highway Patrol, uh, the Grill Team in Sydney, our Triple M Breakfast Show there. Um, this year alone, we've probably launched about ten new breakfast. Sh- oh no, more probably fifteen new breakfast shows around the country. So I'm involved in setting those teams up. Um, so when you say look after them, what do you mean as a producer? Always because this producer director thing always yeah. flips me over. So w- when you say look after them, what do you mean? So that's a good question. In radio, and the reason I love radio is. The producer works directly with the talent and the content. There's no, um, there's you know, uh, rather than in TV where you sort of have segment producers, uh, executive producers, senior producers, um, network producers. In radio, it's a really one-to-one relationship. So a producer, you know, is responsible essentially for the content that goes to air. They have to work directly with the talent to get the best out of them. They have to they they run the show essentially from a you know to use TV language. They run the show, so they uh, are responsible for every element that that, uh, hmm. that that involves. So, um, yeah, so it's looking after people, it's coming up with ideas, it's creating content, it's all keeping of those the energy. Things. It's great, love it's it. Fixing a lot of problems too. Like the radio is teamwork, and uh, with any team, particularly creative teams, there's always um, 
challenges and difficulties. So producers have to be really good at managing um, those issues and uh, and just bringing out the best in their talent, you know. Man, you're saying, like, I know you're a bit concerned coming on doing this interview because I'm not a marketer, I'm not a small business owner, but, like, I, as I've said to my listeners, you know, like, there are so many learnings we can get from outside the small business world from people who who have completely different skill sets. And I, I know what you're about to share is going to be exactly we, – we, there's going to be some gems in there, Sam. Oh, Good. So, well, you say all good. I'm relying on you. Yeah, okay. Well, pressure then. Yeah, correct. So, Do so we need drum rolls? Go, if you've got a drum roll handy, like, um, please feel free to, um, okay. you know, do you want me to uh, buy some time? No, while you what go about your... something like this? Uh, yeah, and then we drop yeah. the gem at the end? Yeah, yeah. What, what have we got there? Shit, pressure. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Uh... Oh, that, you are, you're a producer with a sense of humour. I reckon you might That's edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't edit here. That's a we big build-up to nothing. Okay, Sammy, what, okay, let's let's get stuck into this because you've coined. I love people who coined thing, coined phrases, but you've, you you coined this concept of fans, not listeners. That's so right. Before you explain that, let's go back and tell me the story of how yeah, how okay. the penny dropped around that concept. Fans, not listeners. Um, all right. Uh, so l- this year, early this year. Um, I connected with uh, a woman who worked for a very high-profile international band. Very. Uh, very big. Yeah, really big. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, through through my, my job, I sort of um, made contact with her and I just, you know, on a bit of a, a, bit of a, a punt, I just said, why don't you come over here and, and I'd love you to do some work. Like you work with, with bands, I'd love you to just take some of those philosophies and work with some of our shows. Um, some of our radio shows. And so she came out here and we did some some workshops and a lot of amazing stuff came out of that. But one of the things that sort of really hit me between the eyes was she kept referring to fans and she kept saying, you know, your fans want this and what sort of fans are, are you trying to attract and how are you looking after your fans? And I just went, that's such a simple um, but important transition for us to stop thinking about listeners because we talk about our listeners, listeners of a radio show, that's how we reference our audience. But most of our shows, in particularly the successful ones, their content is much broader than radio content. Their content has to live online. It has to be on social media. Uh, they create events. They create cross-media relationships. So their content ends up on TV, in magazines. Um, so by thinking and referencing fans instead of listeners, you kind of, you, you, it just opens up much bigger opportunities for well, the sorts of content that you're doing. And listen, the, the concept of a listener is very passive. That's someone who's sitting back yep. listening. Yeah, and not engaging. That's right. Whereas a fan is like, you know, there's a book raving fans in marketing parlance, which is like yeah. people who are like Apple have raving fans, evangelists. Yeah, and I'm sure the shows that you produce, there would be evangelists Absolutely. within the set of fans. You know, someone said to me the other day, and it's interesting. No one sticks a TV brand on the back of their car. But people still put radio logos on the back of their car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know, but, you know, uh, I think that people have an intimate relationship with a radio show. And um, But gone are the days where we can expect someone to be sitting in a car at 10 past 8 and hear something that we do. Mm. We've got to make all that content work a lot harder for us. And the Hot 30 is a great example. That's our national night show. They are essentially programming a radio show every night for an audience that has never owned a radio. I mean, what 16-year-old mm. is going into JB Hi-Fi and trying to buy a new radio? Yep. Like, it just doesn't exist mm-hmm. anymore. So they 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 talk about doing a show on Twitter before it even gets to, to air. So they get hashtags and, and trending topics happening before they're even on the air. So their day and their content, they start pushing from midday to get those kids excited and, and trying to... Like, one last night was amazing. Their whole campaign for the afternoon and into the evening was... Um, what the story was, um, there was a great news story where uh, a DJ, a famous DJ, had been kicked out of a club for playing the song The Macarena. Right. I think I've got the story right. It yeah. was, a, And it was a gossip story that was doing the rounds in the morning. Now, one of the female co-hosts, Mel, loves that song. So the whole campaign was, if we can get um, the Hot 30 Twitter account to 100,000 followers, we will play The Macarena as the number one song of the great. night. 
and it worked. Worked like that. Kids just went bananas. Everyone got mm. bought into it, wanted to 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 affect mm-hmm. the change, and and uh, and it went bananas. So plenty of the kids would have been experiencing the Hot Thirty brand on Twitter and not necessarily listening to the show. The, the whole fans, not listeners, I'm really interested to understand um, once that penny dropped, how it altered the way you packaged up your your products, your shows. Um, from a marketing, small business marketing perspective, I, for a long time, even in big business marketing, often talk about target audiences. Yep. And to me, forever and a day, from the time I heard this concept of a target audience, it felt very lame and very passive to think of someone yeah. who's going to buy my product in the terms of a target audience, which yeah, is rude. It's very clinical. Clinical. It's like an audience. What? What they're sitting back waiting and yeah. watching for us to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> care factor of zero. Exactly. So I kind of, for many years, worked with, um, had a similar kind of thing and worked with this concept of best mates. Like who, mm. who's your brand's best mates? Yeah. Who's that group of people that have the highest propensity mm. to want to buy from you as a small business owner? When you, when you call them your best mates, what I've found, and I'm interested to know what you found in now thinking them as fans and having your on-air talent think of them as fans, is that a best mate is someone you know intimately. You know what problems they have that you can solve. Right. You know how they feel about certain, in this case, purchase decisions. Mm-hmm. You don't worry about the demographics. You don't worry about, you know, your mates, whether the, what age, gender, you know, occupation they are. They're your best mates. Yeah. You, you worry about them more in a more sociological way, mm-hmm. yeah? So from your point of view... Tell me how, when the penny dropped, how that changed the way your on-air talent approached. Well, I get. I think, like I said earlier, a lot of our shows were thinking much more broadly about their content. Like most of our shows don't just go, right, well, there's the idea and here's the radio component. Most of our shows are going, okay, here's the idea. Here's how we're going to push it on social media. Here's how we're going to do it online. Is there, you know, maybe we'll create a little mini event out of it. Maybe we should contact contact that magazine they'd be interested in that content but it's still we're still thinking about we're still talking about listeners Mm -hmm. whereas fundamentally changing it to fans meant all of that stuff is just as important and is part of the conversation at the uh, origin of the idea rather Mm -hmm. than as okay so we did this cool thing on air now what do we do with it online or you know that after the fact kind of thinking, whereas now it's every idea has to stand up, you know, and, yeah. and, and I guess I just keep saying, you know, in radio, one thing, I think what's protecting radio a little bit more than other old medias like newspapers and television is we make a lot of content really cost effectively every day. Mm. You know, we generate, a, and I'm trying not to swear. Mm-hmm. That's why I have to Do keep swearing. Uh, we generate a shitload of content. Yeah, like yeah. that's that's what we're good at. Now, thinking about fans and listeners is saying, okay, for every piece of content you make, make it work as hard for you as it possibly can. And I can give you just a quick example from this morning. Mm-hmm. Um, American the Highway Patrol, which is our national drive show on the Triple M network, um, had this great idea. Merrick had this thing he'd wanted to get off the ground for um, for years. He wanted to build a carbecue. A what? A carbecue. He wanted to build a car <laughs> that had a barbecue, barbecue built into it. Yeah. So you could drive it and anywhere, and uh, <laughs> and then you just flip out the barbecue out the back and yep. and cook your your barbecue. So. Um, anyway, he went and spent literally the entire marketing budget of the show on building this car. He bought an old, I think it's called a Ford Landau. I'm not a car person, right. but it's the car that Mad Max drove in the, oh, yeah? in the Mad Max films. Got it, you know, got it fully specked up and looked awesome. Matte black finish, Highway Patrol logo, Triple M everywhere. And this thing looks amazing. Like literally this this barbecue. Remembering f- this is radio. So this is exactly. so far it's theatre of the mind. Exactly. Um, have this, they had this great story arc as, as he's told his team after the fact that he spent their marketing budget on this car, which shocked them to say the least. Um, then the car then goes around um, venues and, and work sites and places where people are gathering right. and cooks a barbecue for fans. So yeah. on the air go, right, this is where the car is. Um, go and get yourself a free sausage or steak or whatever. People are booking the car out to do things oh, like wow. – you can rent the car if you want the 
Carbecue to be your wedding car. <laughs> Just go on the Highway Patrol website. Yep. So you're getting in front of new listeners. I mean, I so just- what you've done is this. Marketers would call it repurposing your content. So you've originally had an idea of a, of a carbecue, mm. yeah. So now you've gone. There's there's fodder for our radio show that we can talk about. Mm. Now we've got this car going out on site, so it's in face front to of, face. But in front of people who aren't listening to to the radio show, that's the thing. I reckon we're always preaching to the converted if we're only thinking about listeners. Yep. When you're thinking about content that is outside just listeners, yep. you're bringing in a new audience, people who might not have ever heard the Highway Patrol. But this awesome car rocks up to your work site, yep. starts cooking you sausages. So, so so then there's just like social media. Wow, you know exactly. this is what social media is. Made for to totally. share stuff. You've well, got to have stuff to share. Well, here's and here's the kicker this morning. Um, one of the producers sent the uh, the story to the Huffington Post online. Yep. They wrote an article on it. Um, the you know the Kelly and Regis the Kelly and Regis show in America, which no. is like their nationally syndicated talk show. It's now right. Kelly and Michael, but it's a really famous brand that's been around okay. twenty years and it has about twenty million viewers a morning. This morning they ran a story on the barbecue. Oh wow! So now back in Australia, all the media is going wow. Yep, American the Highway Patrol just got on this show whose television audience is more people than live in this country. So, so, so what we, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> um, so we've got radio discussion, we've got social media, we've got on site, we've got, um, you know, overseas publicity, mm-hmm. um, there's probably Which YouTube videos, I'm totally. assuming. But the thing with overseas publicity and people go, why do you worry about that? Those yep. people don't have surveys, but it just adds a little bit of stardust to it. it so now everyone in Australia is going, well, there's another article. So this, tomorrow morning there'll be press in in Australia talking about how this Australian bogan, Merrick Watts, has got his idea up and now in America they're talking about it. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So it's just... And, and you've got an income stream because you're renting the car out. <laughs> Who manages Well, we're the- not. We're not. Oh, we're giving it away. Oh, are you? But Is it competition? Yeah. No, you just register and uh, and if <laughs> and if we can get it to you, then um, then you can go for it. But so, Brilliant. I mean, we're, look, we're, there's there's a lot we can do with, with thinking about, you know, getting it to the next test match in, in Sydney. So it's there and, and people as they're on their way in or out or at lunchtime. Oh, as if a car manufacturer is not going to put their hand up and say, we'll manufacture a, a lot of barbecues. Well, do you know, it's really interesting. We had a lot of issues selling this idea to clients. A lot of clients just couldn't get their head around you know, they but again, you know, maybe it was too visual, I don't know, but there was a couple of big clients that were lined up that were close and then just sort of chickened out at the last minute. And, I, and look, it's a it's a difficult market out there at the moment, but um, I can't remember the name. I should be able to uh, – the Australian Meat or – Oh, yeah, Livestock Association. Yeah. yeah so yeah. St- they said, we, if you can cook steaks on this thing, <laughs> we're with you. The guy on the American th- – their whole tagline is chuck a steak on the barbie. Yeah, right. That's their tagline. They're on board. They're the, they're the principal sponsor so, of this idea. But here's the thing. On the on this show in America this morning, the guy actually read out the, the tagline, oh, chuck a steak on the barbie. Hey, so the Livestock Association will be all over you. I hope you so. You just got a new sponsor. So, Sammy, you, had, you told another, another story which I'd love you to share with my listeners, which is um, – I'm going to age myself here, but Reese Matston. Reese Maston. Maston? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I, I love it, just the way things are changing. So back, back to this concept of, of fans, not listeners. Yeah. Tell so, us about Reese. So Reese is an amazing young man. So he's 17. He won X Factor, uh, la- not this year, last year in Australia. So, uh, yeah, 17 years old, um, has had a couple of really successful singles, but he is just the king of Twitter. So his whole fan base, he he speaks to them you know, several ten times a day on Twitter, and it's him, and it's it's abs- it's him, and it's in his pocket, and, he, and he's concept. doing it. He's doing it himself um, all the time. He, he talks about there's never an off cycle. He's always pushing content to them, giving them what they want. Photos. His fan base really cleverly. He he. Um, orchestrated in such a way that they came up with their own name. So they're called the Little Rockers and they identify nice. as that. And, and um, you know, they, when he releases product, they... Small business, big marketing listeners, come up with a name for yourselves. <laughs> and I your fan that. base, yeah. yeah oh, yeah, yeah your yeah, fan yeah, base, yeah, exactly absolutely. Right. I'd love that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, so they... Um, when he has product, they try and get um, Reese Maston or like the hashtag, which might be his new single um, or the album I think was called um, Beautiful Nightmare, hashtag Beautiful Nightmare, get it trending worldwide. And mm-hmm. they just go bang, mm-hmm. let's make that happen. So they, they push his content for him. But a great case study he said to us was um, 
and I might use a little bit of poetic license with this story, but... Don't let the truth get in the way of this story, Sam. I never do until I'm on the record. <laughs> but um, so Sony Music uh, had, you know, he was releasing a DVD. Now, just most record companies would put all their above-the-line marketing budget into releasing albums and singles rather than DVDs because they just make more money. So his idea, Reese's idea was, why don't we just get um, the 10 most socially engaged fans on Twitter? Um, so by that, I mean, like, these are 16-year-old kids that themselves have thousands of followers mm-hmm. on Twitter. Let's get them into the boardroom at Sony and just the day before it comes out, why don't we just let them watch the the DVD? So they do that. They, they handpick and invite these, you know, real, his fan base, that, but the ones that are really doing most of the work on Twitter for him, bring them in. They watch it the day before the, the DVD's release. He then, once the DVD's finished, comes in and surprises them and says, hey, thanks so much for being oh, here. They lose easy. their mind. Yeah. They get a photo with him and the DVD, and um, those kids then push that on Twitter, and the thing goes double platinum without spending any money. Above I think the, the line. lesson here for small business owners is clearly create content that people are going to want to share. I think yeah. often, uh, and maybe you guys have even fallen into the trap early days of social media, is just pushing stuff out there, yeah. hoping that it'll get traction. Whereas what you find is that when you create something interesting, mm-hmm. and, and you know, us small business owners don't have the ability to go and create necessarily carbacues or you know have mm-hmm. Reese Matston run into the boardroom. But that said, it's like what, the question is what could we create that's interesting that that other that our fan base that our best mates would share and and hopefully that's kind of this discussion stimulating that it's about sharing it but it's also about what can you reward them with for using and talking about you on social yeah, media yeah yeah absolutely so you know if if you're able to get you know if this hashtag trends in melbourne you know maybe what's a give me an example of a business Oh, um, Jim's mowing. Jim's mowing. <laughs> I think they're doing all right. They're though. doing okay. Um, but if you, say um, you're a pizza shop, and if you're able to get, if everyone that comes, I'll, I'll in, use an old one, uh, an old, a previous listener mm-hmm. who always gets a laugh. Big Richard condoms. <laughs> hey, that'll put you on the spot. <laughs> but that's perfect. But yeah. you know, Big Richard condoms might have a, you know, he might have some money that he's about to put into marketing. What's a what's a prize element that he could give? So maybe he's, he's got packages. He's got the shag pack. The, sh- the shag pack, he's got the Superman pack. Perfect. Well, he can then say anyone who retweets this goes in, you know, and he yep. might has a, has a marketing message uh, that is, you know, here's our website link or, you know, here's our deal, here's our special. If yep. you retweet this message, you go in the draw to win a lifetime supply of dingers or yep. whatever it is. Yeah. So people just will retweet that. He can then just pick out a couple of people that have big Twitter followers, yep. give them the product give them a photo, give them some content that they want to share with their friends. Yep. Away you go. Love the fact that you use the word dingers, Sammy. I haven't heard that one for a while. Hey, now, that good segue into idea slash content creation because, okay, get the whole idea of fans, not listeners. I think it's fantastic. Great new way of framing the people that you're selling to. Mm-hmm. Um, coming up with ideas – I know for a fact is challenging and I know that many small business owners even shy away from it. I was speaking at a conference recently and a guy came up afterwards. He was an insurance salesman and he came, he'd come up, he, he just tapped me on the shoulder. He goes, can I share an idea with you? Mm. So you clever. said no. No, I said no. He did anyway. <laughs> I walked away. He was going, hey, no, 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 I want yeah, to share right. the idea. Yeah, yeah got it. But, um, he said, tweet me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just hashtag it, yeah, Tim. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bo. No, no, but what he'd done was, you know, like, um, not, uh, not happy, I was going to say not happy, Jan. You know Rhonda, the, yeah. the AAMI campaign Rhonda, mm-hmm. uh, overseas listeners, very famous Australian campaign for car insurance, um, set in Bali. Mm-hmm. And he had hired some Australian surfers to walk up and down the beach at Kuta with T-shirts saying Rhonda, Rhonda, Rhonda. Oh, wow. It, handing out business cards offering insurance discounts, which maybe – sailing a little bit close to the wind from a legal point of view, don't know. You know mm-hmm. Let's not go there. Suffice to say, that is a big idea. But what happened after that is, I don't know if you've been to Bali recently, but every bloke in Bali is now selling knockoff T-shirts of those <laughs> yeah, and yeah, stickers. Yeah, right, okay. I love Rhonda. I love Rhonda. Yeah. But my point being, that's a big idea and there's mm. courage in big ideas. And I'm just yeah. interested, could you talk a bit about how you guys – generate ideas. I had this chat to Jules Lund a mm-hmm. few weeks ago where Jules was explaining he literally carries his iPhone with him mm. and when stuff happens, he'll either record it or mm. video it or mm. jot it down. It's annoying when you're having dinner with him. I can imagine. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Jules, that wasn't yeah. an idea. It was just me eating, you <laughs> yeah, know, exactly. like grow up. Tell us about idea development. Um, 
it, God, it's it's such a big thing. I, I guess I've spent most of my career working on that, mm. um, and probably never formalised it. Yeah, look, do you know what the book that I've read a lot uh, in the field of creativity and and um, and the book that connected with me the most was Steal Like an Artist, which uh, you've probably seen. No, never heard of it. Steal Like an Artist. So it's this guy, Austin or Cleon. Powers? Cleon? No. <laughs> um, no. But Steal Like an Artist, it's really short. It's, it's, it's a great, it's about how every, I- there's no such thing as an original idea. Every idea mm-hmm. is a synthesis of different ideas. Yep. And that's in radio, you're constantly going, stimulus in. What's my twist? There's the idea. So you pick up, you open the paper and go- Stimulus in, what's my idea? What's my twist? What's What's my link? What's, you know, so- Hey guys, it's Timbo here. I have had to sneak out of the studio with Sammy um, because Sammy was just about to give an example and describe how he uses that process. But the example he gave was around a fairly sensitive topic. So instead of going with that, I'm going to show you how I've used that idea generating structure for a client who sits on my deep dive mastermind group. Now, the client is the Tasty Bird Cafe in Ararat in regional Victoria. So if you ever want a bloody good piece of chicken, I would head up and see Jason at the Tasty Bird Cafe. However, this is how we used it. Stimulus Inn was quite simple. Jason recognised that on a Wednesday, it was the middle of the week, or Wednesday is the middle of the week, and everyone's just hanging for the weekend, right? So that's the Stimulus Inn. The link for the Tasty Bird Cafe to play on was the fact that they're already doing these wonderful deals called Tight Ass Tuesdays, right? So there's already some kind of um, marketing idea happening there. They have Tight Ass Tuesdays. So given that Wednesdays is generally referred to as hump day, that middle of the week, that hump day, the question is, what idea comes from that? And the idea that we came up with on the Mastermind Group was that they could do, the Tasty Bird Cafe could sell camel burgers on hump day. Okay, now that freaked Jason out a little bit because it was like camel burgers, we don't do camel, people don't eat camel, but camel tastes like chicken, doesn't it? Okay, so what? What anyway, what Jason ended up doing was not quite going to the point of camel burgers, but he's put these camel meals together, which involves chicken and lots of other yummy goodies, okay? Um, and then he promotes it on, on his board, outside the shop, on flyers, he's doing a radio ad, he's even, even an idea came from another mastermind member, which was all about promoting it at childcare centres where mums were picking up their kids and on hump day just feeling like, you know, tired and it's like, oh, do I have to create another meal? So um, it was a great place to promote it. So stimulus in, what's the twist or the link in your business and what idea comes from that? And so that's an example of how we use that idea generating structure that Sam's just described. Now you go and use it too. Let's go back into the studio and keep talking to the wonderful Sammy Kavanagh. You've just given a structure to creating ideas. How then, because it's then, it'd be really easy to rain, well, it is really easy to rain on ideas, isn't it? It's like, or not have the confidence to go, you know what, Mm. that'd be really good. Let's Mm. try it. So, Do you know what? The best way to have good ideas is to have lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. And there's a great book called The Creative Habit, Mm -hmm. which I read um, recently from a woman whose name I can't remember either, but um, she's one of America's foremost ballet choreographers, choreographers, (laughs) and she just talks about, you know, it's the habit. You got, you know, it's and my habit is I get into work, I turn my computer on, I grab the newspaper, and I walk to a coffee shop that's a little way away to get a coffee. And it's that walk where I'm looking at the news, and I'm just that's my habit of I don't sort of come back from the coffee shop without five or six ideas, mm-hmm. and that's my habit. And because I've been doing it for ten years, it does become automatic. Mm-hmm. And I think that the and most of those ideas are shit, but it's the it's the best so way to the have filter where is the filter that that says oh hang on is it just a gut feeling or do you have a set of criteria that says yeah. it ticks those three boxes so we're going to do it do you look for nah. other people to go sammy you're a genius nah. you know boy, where's the well, look, ra- something r- yeah but radio is a team sport and that's what's lucky is you pitch an idea in a in a planning meeting and you know pretty quickly if that if the room catches on fire right. or if no one cares and sometimes you go nah I reckon there's more in it I'll put that away and I'll pitch it another day or so that is gut feeling 
Yeah, it is gut feeling. But again, the, but the more ideas you have, the better chance there is of having a good idea. Mm-hmm. I think someone said that once and I've stolen it from them. But yeah, the best way to have a good no, idea is to have lots of original lot, ideas, Sammy. But the best, the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. Right. Good idea has a thousand fathers. A bad idea is an orphan. Correct. <laughs> Thank you. Drum roll. Symbols, uh, something. You got to have something there. Yeah, um, drum roll. No, no, don't go the don't drum roll. You okay. can't do a drum roll after the fact. So maybe that I would be it. weird. Um, here we go. Yeah, what do you so, got? So give me your line again. A, a good idea has a thousand fathers. A bad idea is an orphan. Oh, that is good. Gee, I love the symbols. Sammy, um, I just want to finish off talking about social media. You've touched on social media. Mm-hmm. Um Social media is an ongoing struggle for small businesses. See, and that's why is it a struggle? Oh, like, hang on. Well, by you saying that, you've, you you well, almost imply. Me off. What? What? You find it easy? No, it's not that it's easy, but it's like it's the it's got to be the greatest gift oh, for any come small on. business. It's free. Oh, hang on, hang on. That is a ridiculous. No, you can't. Yeah, it is. It is free, and that, that and many small businesses go great. It's the silver bullet. It's the panacea. It's free, and it's an opportunity to get my message out. Correct. But it's just because it doesn't make it good. You know, sometimes you're better off spending money on stuff to market your business than just going down the free path. But it's not an either or scenario. But no, what, it's not. what what I what I get frustrated at is people struggling with it because I think if you think you're struggling, like it's okay to not know about it. It's, it's okay to, to, to go, wow, I've got a lot to learn about that. Mm-hmm. But if you're already going, I struggle with that, then I think you're starting from a bad place because I just- Well, some, some avoid it. So there's, there's many reasons why many small businesses don't do it or if they do it, they get it wrong. You know, it's not, a, it's not often where I meet a small business that's absolutely crushing their social media presence. I interviewed a company a few months ago, Black Milk Clothing, makes leggings, um, absolutely crushing it with their social media. Has Crushing it's a good thing? Crushing is a great thing, got nailing it. it yep. okay? that's, that's groove talk. It's young person that's talk. young person talk. Stay away from that. Correct. Um, it'll go nowhere. <laughs> it'll lead to tears. So, um, but, you know, so Black Milk are really doing great stuff, but I don't see that very often. I, I think what we forget, Yep. And, and clearly, you guys must be nailing it. I look forward to hearing uh, how you, your shows are using it. Uh, suffice to say, well, let me just say, social media is people having conversations online. That's how I define it. That's And if you kind of look at it that way, forget hashtags, forget retweets, forget likes, forget all the tech talk and go, it's just people talking online. Cool. So therefore, when you talk to someone, you want to offer good quality content in the hope that you'll engage them in yeah. a conversation and the conversation continues. And at some point they go, really like you, what do you got to sell? That type of thing, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think many businesses kind of go straight to the sell. They forget the foreplay type right. stuff and go straight for the you Can know Can I give what. you an example of that? Go. The moment the penny dropped for me was um, I used to see our Facebook page with the show that I probably spend most of my time on, the Fifi and Jules show that you referenced before. Mm-hmm. I, sp- I used to see Facebook as an opportunity to promote our content, mm-hmm. to go, hey, we've done this on the radio show, get it on Facebook and see if we can get more people looking at it um, because we've already made it and it's free. So use Facebook as a promotional vehicle. And then there was a moment where we'll la- – this year – was it this year? When were the Olympics? This year or last year? This year. Jesus. Yeah. So as we're preparing for the London Olympics, Byron, who's the anchor of the show – Put a, a helmet, cam- a little GoPro stuck on his head, and GoPro. we took a, f- a little, a little, um, little digital camera, video camera on his yeah. head. And um, we- I'm trying to get the owner of GoPro on the show, but he's not responding to my emails. Well, no. you should get your Twitter community to make Correct. it happen. Correct. So we took a photo of that, and we put it on Facebook, and we just said, "Hey, if we can get ten thousand likes of the- on this photo, we will make Byron wear this stupid thing on his head the entire time we're in London." Right. And then we're not in the habit of begging for likes. I think you've got to use that mm-hmm. tool really sparingly. Mm-hmm. But it was a funny photo. Byron looks super uncomfortable and Byron photographs really well. He's a good looking guy. So we pushed that. It got 37,000 likes in about eight hours, which put it into the news feeds of a million people. Because hmm. when on Facebook, your yeah. analytics, it'll tell you how many news Leverage. feeds. Yeah. So a million people, right? At that moment, I went, that's more people than are listening to that radio break. 
Yeah. So more people are experiencing that content on Facebook yeah. than are listening to the radio. And so. then that, that seeing that photo drives people back to the show. Because so, what can, they were able just... to do is affect change. They were able to have an impact. And then the video that we made from the helmet cam on Byron's Head for the week in London, we pushed that back to that to that conversation feed. So those people got a payoff a week later for, hey, thanks for liking the photo. Yeah, we right. made it happen. Here's the video. Good on you. Let's stitch Byron up again. I want to pull you up, though, because you're kind of – observation of like, why do they find social media so hard? Which is kind of, not, you didn't say that, but kind of what you inferred a little bit. Fair? I, I, no, my, my frustration is, is if people, I think it's fine to be overwhelmed and it's fine to go, I don't know anything about this. Yep. But if you're not a small business going, this is an opportunity that I must understand, mm-hmm. yeah. then I think just pack up and go home. It's, put it this way. So, as I say, when I talk about this stuff, social media isn't going away. Facebook might not be here in five years' time, but it'll be replaced with another social media channel that'll give us the opportunity to have conversations online. So, yeah, mm. absolutely get in there and embrace it. I don't want listeners... Oh, there'll, there'll be some listeners right now going, yeah, but Sam's responsible for shows that have interesting people, funny people, with the ability to, to walk into a studio like we have right now and literally hit record, create content, mm. have marketing budgets, go out, do fun stuff. Mm. They have the ability to do that, whereas small business owners, and what I love is you've shared a, a concept earlier of how to generate ideas, which is great because yeah. that is the solution, is like to have a process of generating but, content. I was having a conversation with a mate who runs a – he's a mortgage broker, and he this we had this very conversation. He's like, Facebook, mate, what, am I, what do I do? Like, I'm being told I've got to get into it. I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. And the first thing you have to do is – you can't be a spectator of this stuff. You, you've got to just pick – if you can't, you've got to pick either Facebook or Twitter pick or both. One. Yeah, LinkedIn, you know, YouTube. L- whatever. Just pick one channel yep. and you've got to interact with it. You, you won't understand it reading a book or, or being a spectator. You can listen first. You can get in have, and watch the conversation before you open up a – But I also think there's a level of – particularly with Twitter and Facebook. I mean, I don't – like I'm on Twitter and I've had to – I've had to develop content and, and send tweets yep. just to g- get my head around it. Yep. Otherwise, you, you're just a spectator. You're not a player. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the first thing. And then I said to him, and he's, a, he's a, as I said, a mortgage broker, you're in finance. Like, you have information that people need. So you've just got to write a blog. And if you if I saw in my Facebook feed, um, I don't want to use his name. Let's pretend his name is John Smith. John Smith, uh, you know, interest rate. Smithy. Smithy. John Smith, uh, uh, you know, blog update. Um, the Reserve Bank has dropped the interest rate. Um, if you've got a mortgage, here's three things you should do now. Mm-hmm. I'm reading that because mm-hmm. I, I have a away. mortgage and I, I, I want that information. Yep. And he's like, yeah, no, I do do stuff like that, but I just send it as an email to a couple of mates. Nah. And I'm like, no, why no, would no, you no. do it as an email? Mm. If you put it on Facebook, I'll like that. I'll send that to my... Yeah, you know, four hundred well, friends. Well, even better, what you do is you put it on your website and then grab the link and put it totally. on Facebook because then people click on it and hundred percent. Or Facebook here's two for the third one. Click into my yeah. into my website. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're selling fish and chips or uh, interest or rates or you don't sell interest rates or dingers. I suppose or you do dingers. Whatever. Dingers. <laughs> yeah, like whatever your industry is, like whatever your field is, someone somewhere wants that knowledge mm. or wants that product mm. or is interested in what you do. And so you don't have to be – that's the other great thing about – and I'm sure – I know you're a big fan of Seth Godin, but his that's new book – It's so funny. I was just thinking that. We're all weird. We're all weird. That's How the, good is that the book? Best. Do you want to explain it to people? Oh, well, it just it's based on the premise that um, we are all weird. We, there is someone out there somewhere – that is interested in something micro and niche, just as you are. And that's what the internet has, has given every one of those small communities, uh, an audience and a place to connect. So how does that impact? Uh, and let's finish up on this discussion because it was kind of where I did want to finish anyway because po- podcasting plays to Seth's concept of we're all weird because yeah. I can go and create a, co- a podcast about – you know, Turkish coffee. Yep. And there will be an audience in the world who just want to hear every week Absolutely. about Turkish coffee, right? Mm-hmm. You are producing shows that go out to the masses. Mm-hmm. So it's very, very hard to niche it down. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a threat to what you guys are doing? Because I, I, I can I just add, I listen to a podcast. I love Green, I love green Guide Letters. <laughs> yeah, right? It's a great it's podcast. It's a great podcast. Yeah. Uh, listeners, don't listen to that. Keep listening to Small Business, Big Marketing. <laughs> but, but, you know, 
I listen to that at the expense probably of tuning into a show that you produce. Mm-hmm. I still love you as a friend. Thank you. My pleasure. But but is that a threat to you guys? Do you know what? I think um, I think where media, all media is is going through that revolution now, and I think that. You know, in Australia, you would. Uh, this might not mean much to international listeners, but you know, our biggest uh, newspaper company sacked nine nineteen hundred people this year. Mm-hmm. Um, our biggest TV network was in debt four billion dollars. So, <laughs> I think that something's re- happening. That revolution is it, we're we're living through it. I think there will always be a need for advertisers. Like there will always be a mass audience, and there will always be people who want to belong to the mass and want to go and and want to listen to the top ten songs. Mm. And um, but you know that is a smaller percentage of the market now. But there, but it's still there. Mm-hmm. You know there is still an audience for. The Master Chefs, the Blocks, yes. the, the Voice, but as for every voice, there's also, you know, a karaoke competition where people can sing in Dutch, uh, you yeah, know, and yeah. do rap songs. Like, you yeah. know, there's so I think that as exciting and as as an op, a bigger opportunity as there are for niche audiences, I think there will always be a need for mass. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, the mass, yeah. in some sense, defines what the niche is. Wow. That's deep. Thanks, man. Sammy, did video kill the radio star? Uh, no. Cocaine did. <laughs> Sam Kavanagh, <laughs> executive producer of the Oz Stereo Network. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Tim. See you, mate. What about that? Hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed doing that interview and bringing it to you. Um, if you enjoyed it, if you've got some feedback, head over to the show notes at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, episode 117. Leave a comment say anything. I love getting feedback because it means I know what's working and what's not working. So uh, please go ahead and do that. And if you love the show, head over to iTunes and leave a listener review as well. And thank you to all those that have done that. Next week, we have got Richard Everson from the country guest house called Shoneg. And it's an award-winning country guest house. And Richard is doing some great marketing. Great example of small business, big marketing. You know, it's not always about getting the Mia Friedmans and the and the Sam Kavanaghs of the world on the show. It's also about getting those little guys on the show who are punching far, far, far above their marketing weight. And next week's interview is a great example of a small business doing exactly that. So until next time, guys, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for being part of the tribe. Don't forget to head over to Meetup. Go to the show notes, leave a comment, do all that type of stuff, get involved because this show is here to make your marketing rock. See you next time. You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show with Tim Reid. Want more marketing goodness? Then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com.